Thanks for the introduction, uh, Frederick. Okay, I'll be talking about standard APIs in the context of engineering, uh, what their impact is, um, and actually, Ruben already highlighted some of my earlier slides, so he stole my thunder already. You, you already have an idea of what I will be talking about. But I think, okay, I'll give a few more details about it. I think most often when we talk about OSLC, we hear about linking, syncing, data exchange, and I think the advantages of decoupling applications from data aren't that super clear. So I'll just try to explain what that means, especially for new applications that, can, that will be built. I'll just say quickly something about myself. I have a background in aerospace engineering, and it's during my PhD that I worked on data integration. My supervisor wanted me to apply AI in, en in engineering, so that based on requirements, we would automatically reconfigure plenty of different simulation models to find the optimal architecture. Um, I found the topic super interesting. I spent six years working on this, but I quickly found out that my approach would not scale. I had to work with many different data sources, and I had to, of course, access the data and change the data in different data sources. And that's where I noticed, uh oh, I'm, I have a real problem. I need to use standards as much as possible. And at the time, uh, I was thinking about standardizing how I would describe the system architecture, the, the, the model which would contain all the information exchanged across the disciplines. And at that time, SysML didn't yet exist, so I, 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 I used UML. That did reduce, of course, the integration efforts, but it didn't solve the complete problem. Um, I continued with this approach then during my postdoc for another two years, <coughs> and it's only after my academic career that I actually was lucky in a consulting project to hear about OSLC. And that's where I realized, oh, we shouldn't just focus on standardizing the data, but it's the APIs that can also be standardized. Um, I'll quickly try to describe the challenges in collaboration in engineering try to make, maybe make the business case for uh, why it's an important topic. I'll to quickly talk about standard APIs, applications decoupled from data, and I'll finish off by uh, talking about graphs, why graphs are important, especially in the world of connected data. So these are a few quotes from the head of knowledge management at NASA. NASA, one of the best engineering organizations in the world, really respected, they use all the possible common off-the-shelf tools, all the standards that exist. And nevertheless, if you look at the quotes, you'll see that they, these are quite serious problems. 46% uh, of workers can't find the information about half the time. 54% of decisions are made with inconsistent or incomplete or inadequate information. So this means that all these collaboration troubles, they need to be over they, they, you need to overcome them with additional effort. It means that engineers need to put in an extra effort to find the information, to get the right information, to make sure that it's accurate, the right version. Instead of focusing really on, on design and on, on, on doing what they like to do and creating new ideas, creating, sorry, coming up with new ideas and, and new designs. This is maybe why also we aren't seeing that much innovation, maybe, in these traditional engineering disciplines. Engineering is just not obviously a, a unidisciplinary activity. Everybody knows it's multidisciplinary. Um, and these activities can't be uh, done independently. There are many overlaps between the different activities. And you have plenty of different relationships. Uh, logical relationships, such as a requirement satisfied or t uh, verified by a test plan. You have mathematical relationships such as, okay, this parameter value needs to be equal in this other model. You have semantic correspondences so that you need to know that, okay, if I have a component here in the architecture model, I'm going to have a part in the geometric model. Um, and all these relationships, they make sure that I at the end of the day, you have models that are consistent and that describe the same system. Now, Engineering is complex because all these cross-cutting relationships are in our minds. We're not capturing them digitally. We're not capturing them in, in our computer in a way that we can 
to manage them more efficiently. We have, for the individual disciplines, we have plenty of common off-the-shelf tools, but when it comes to managing these relationships, the cross-cutting ones, actually we don't have good tools right now. Uh, this is an old example, and I'm just going to, to quickly go over it. Um, this is an SUV, which typically has a higher center of gravity than most vehicles, and therefore also a higher risk of doing a rollover. And therefore, the, uh, the government agencies, they release some requirements. For example, that the center of gravity cannot be too high compared to the vehicle width. So in this, this position of the center of gravity would be computed in the geometric model. And you would have relationships then going from the requirement to the geometric model. There's another requirement that says that if the vehicle does a quick left and right turn, it's called a fish hook maneuver, that the vehicle cannot lose contact with the ground by more than two, two wheels. And, uh, and so that simulation model, it needs to uh, know the information from the geometric model it needs to be tied to a test plan related to the requirement. So we see here the, the digital thread spanning multiple uh, disciplines. Actually, I remember that when I was studying, a big car manufacturer failed that, this official community. I don't know if you remember. Uh, oh, you do. All right, there you go. <laughs> what are the cross-cutting concerns that are really you know, complicated for engineers? Um, if it, uh, it all comes down to traceability, of course. As soon as you have traceability, it becomes easier to address the cross-cutting concerns. But if you ask an engineer about change management, about optimization, trade-off studies, reuse, product line engineering, or variant management, these are the tough topics for engineers. They won't be able to give you a very quick answer, an easy answer, because it's a cross-disciplinary activity. It requires access to multiple models, multiple data sources. Your common off-the-shelf solution right now will provide you a limited integration capability. It's going to provide you an integration between selected applications, a limited set of applications. It's not bad, it's good, all right. But in engineering, we have 2,000 plus applications. So these common off-the-shelf off, common off solutions that provide integration maybe between 20, maximum 20, 30 applications, it's, it's a tiny bit, it's, a, it's, it's, it's not, it doesn't cover the, the solution that we need. Um, therefore, we have integration solutions called ALM, PLM, solu uh, Simulation Data Process Management, or SPDM, I, I forgot the, the acronyms, there are so many acronyms. We now have a lot of new data that we need to manage, all the sensor data that we're collecting in IoT platforms. So I really think that we have to think beyond common off-the-shelf solutions. We have to think of something that can tie all these common off-the-shelf solutions so that we can finally connect all these disciplines. There are two trends that are going to increase the need for uh, traceability. One of them is IoT, we're going to, we are already collecting more data from systems that are in operation, and we need to make sense out of this data. There are plenty of data scientists, they want to access the data, but they can only make sense out of it if the data is connected to the activities that are related to the sensor data. So the sensor data is going to, for example, measure uh, the behavior of a part of your system, but we need to know how the part was manufactured, where, in which manufacturing plant, which workstation, what design principles were used for that part, so that we can tie all this together. It's only with these feedback loops that then data scientists, they can apply the latest machine learning algorithms and tell you, well, we identify patterns here, and clearly we can improve our design process or our manufacturing process. If you ask manufacturers of autonomous vehicles how safe the vehicles are, they will tell you, well, for example, one will tell you, our car drives 10 million miles without accidents. That's their measure right now of safety. It's obviously not enough because we don't know if the 10 million miles were driven around the corner or if they were dri driven in rainy uh, conditions with bad vision, with one sub subsystem failing. We have actually millions of scenarios to cover. And we don't have that traceability right now between the experienced autonomous vehicle behavior 
and the scenarios that need to be satisfied. We need this connectivity so that we are 100% sure that we can say, okay, 80% of the scenarios have been covered by this experienced autonomous vehicle. We are treating data from dis different disciplines as if it's always something special. And we are accepting the fact that data is always presented using different APIs. And we just simply cannot access simply the data because we, we don't have this standard API standard interface. We live in a world where right now we're creating plenty of new solutions based on data. And it's a bit like in the, during the electrical revolution, we were creating plenty of electric devices that, had, that needed to access electric power. So for electric power, we have standard outputs, super easy. We understand that, okay, there are a few aspects of electricity, like amplitude, frequency, and that's it. And actually for data, it's very similar. Data has just some very simple aspects that we can also standardize. What do you do with data? You create it, you read it, you update it, you delete it. These are basic operations. We don't need a different API just to do always the same things. What is so special about data? Data has sometimes versions, especially in engineering. And we're often interested, especially in engineering, to know about the updates. What has changed since yesterday? What are, is the new data in the data set? What is, for example, the new IoT data that we collected last week? All these things are really standard. I don't know why you need to treat all the data as something fancy. And we heard the talk yesterday of Mike Anderson about hypermedia APIs, where it's important that when we use an API, we get a machine-readable description back that allows the client to discover the options, <coughs> and the client can be smart and be actually independent of specific endpoint URLs. So these principles are actually reflected for the basic services, for the basic discovery uh, of these services, for the product services, they're reflected in the OSLT specification. So you have a main entry point um, where you can find out, well, what does this API offer? And you will <coughs> have access to service provider resources, giving you a list of services, telling you what shape of data is expected or is returned. So you can find out on your own uh, what the API gives you without looking at a human readable documentation, just based on the machine readable description of the API. Now I'm sure we can go further in this, this direction and, and, and uh, uh, come up with much more, I think, um, uh, mature and, and, and uh, uh, concepts support hypermedia, but very simple hypermedia concepts, just to discover the basic CRUD services that's already extremely helpful. In OSLC version three, we are building on top of W3C LVP. So I think this is great because we are getting some new friends from the web community and we're aligned with them. And I think it's really exciting to see what we could do together with Solid. Um, I think the ideas are very similar and I, and I, get, I will get to that in a second. APIs, most APIs are just there to return your data, and that's it. But we in engineering, we want to connect the data. And connecting data is means that we need to know the identifiers of data. It's like, if I want to call you, I need to know your unique phone number. So APIs, ideally, should expose data using unique global identifiers, so that the data is unique, is identifiable in a unique way, and then we can start connecting the data. We can use HTTP URLs for these identifiers. It works for documents at web scale. Uh, we can use the same HTTP URLs also for data. This is the, the second key idea, I think, of the SLC. Third one is when we start connecting the data. We end up then with a graph, a set of connected data. Very often I get asked, where are these links saved? I personally think that the links should be accessible also through a standard API. So we have the original data, we have the additional links. All of that should be accessible through a standard API. For a very important reason, so that we can then choose what to do with these links and the data. 
we can choose what to do if we have if we have this decoupling between applications and data. For example, imagine you're a data scientist. You're you have you're familiar with a, a great machine learning algorithm, and you want to apply it on the IoT data. Well, it, you you'll be creating a new application, but you can only do this and, and, and do this quickly if you can access the data. Using a standard API, you no longer depend on accessing the specific API of a tool. No, you can rely on the standard API and have access to the old data. This is very important. You can access existing old data, but create new applications that work with the old data. And um, so this, this decoupling really lowers the barrier of entry for the development of new applications. And I think many traditional engineering organizations they actually, actually see opportunities in IoT to offer new services to their clients. But to offer these new revenue-making services, this is a big business. Independent of which industry you are in, you, you can offer many new subscription services to your clients. It only works if you can easily access your old data and combine it sorry, with the new data. Think about... Google, for example. Google is an example where the application is decoupled from the documents. The documents are everywhere in the world, accessible through a standard interface, and we have competition between different search engines. We benefit from this competition. Bing, Yahoo, Google, and others, they compete at an equal playing field. This is what we also would need in engineering. If you are searching for data, if you want to visualize data, you don't want to have to rely on one single vendor. You ideally would like the best solution for this specific job. And this is possible if we have, just as we have for documents on the web, if we have a standard interface for data. We have created for cli clients these mashup applications, these applications that consume data from different sources and offer some kind of additional value. And they're actually very simple to realize. Most applications that I've heard of, and it makes totally sense, they consume the data and they put it in a graph database, and they offer a knowledge graph. It makes total sense. But we can also take the data and the links and put it, for example, in Elasticsearch, a different kind of database that's going to index the data differently so that we can do a full text search very easily. Full text search is like in Google. So you type a few keywords, or in Amazon, where you type keywords and you say, I'm only interested in, I don't know, this product of this brand and with these characteristics. Right now in engineering, your search capabilities are limited to the scope of your application. You can only look within one PLM system, one requirements management application. It's terrible. It limits, of course, your collaboration opportunities. Obviously, you can create new consolidated views. If it's important to see the data from multiple PLM systems in one view, it's possible. It's, it's very easy to achieve. I'm going to now uh, basically finish off with this. Oh, you have a question. Just on this uh, standard API, I think a few slides before you were showing like API 1, 2, 3, and standard API. I'm not sure if, uh, I think you showed with the arrows like bidirectional, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure if you actually spoke that for, for, for everything that you discussed to work, that API needs to work both ways. Not only the tool, like the test or simulation tool, needs to be able to talk that um, some standard API, but also other tools need to be able to talk to those applications through the same API, right? Uh, yeah, sorry, can you rephrase? I'm not sure I understood, sorry. So I think the important point that maybe you didn't articulate explicitly is that not only for the applications that are beneath, you need to be able to talk uh, with that standard API. But also everything else in this ecosystem oh, yes. needs oh. to be able to consume. Oh, so you're saying like if we create like a, a mesh street, a mesh application a on top of these local data sets, that we also then offer a standard API to some to better share these new uh, added value, for example. Exactly. Yes, that is indeed possible. Yes, exactly. It's a, it's a reflective way, I think, of, of thinking about, yeah. yeah. Uh, 
as soon as we start connecting data, we end up with a graph. And I think for link management, for queries against uh, graphs, we, we, we obviously are putting the data in the graph database. But we've heard that there are also a few challenges regarding performance, for example, when we have to do version management on the graphs. Sodius, you solved the problem so that you can manage multiple global configurations efficiently. I think that in this area, it's, it's, it's for me at least, it's, I think it's an important challenge. It's great that you solved it. Um, we have, as we have more data that becomes available, we have more links to create because we have, if you think about it, the links that we create on the web with documents, they're created manually. We add the link to the HTML documents. But we will have a lot more data than documents on the web using, for example, such a standard API. And manually creating all these links is very time consuming. Especially as when new data becomes available, some links become suspect or broken. They should actually be removed. So we actually ideally need to use latest AI techniques to predict which links should be there or not based on the existing links that we have. So we are, for example, working, uh, we're applying deep learning for this link prediction task. I think solving these, solving these challenges will make working with graphs or with connected data much easier. Um, another challenge that I think nobody has solved is if we start linking data across organizations, so linking data that is owned by multiple organizations. With data, we always have to manage the access rights. Now, if it's data owned by one organization, we can have one central <coughs> data access management system, like an LDAP system, to, to manage the da data access rights. But as soon as we're, we want to manage these access rights for data owned by multiple organizations, and multiple organizations need to be able to review the, the access rights that have been defined, we need a distributed application. And so that's where we have to start thinking about using blockchain, for example. And to use and create a decentralized application to manage these access rights. <coughs> this is not directly, I would say, you know, related to OSLT, but as soon as we start connecting data, we will, I think, more and more be faced with these challenges. This is my final thought. I think you've already understood my point <coughs> that I said earlier. Uh, so I, I'm not going to uh, repeat it. Um, here it says, semantic web experts can make it happen. Actually, I reused my slide from the presentation I gave a few months ago. I should have adapted it. I think we can all make it happen. Um, data is actually simple, all right? We, we, we should look at it as something simple. We should not look at it as something fancy, special. Um, we should actually see it as a universal asset. Everybody in the organization should be able to access data and create something valuable based on it. Um, and, and so that's why we, we, I think value standard APIs are really critical. I personally, when I talk about OSLT, I present OSLT as a candidate for a standard API. I don't know which one, if, in, if it's gonna be OSLT or something el else that will ultimately be adopted. Um, but for me, it's, it's this idea of standard API that is really important that I, I want to, to really push for. Thank you very much. Questions? A small amount. To de scare people from blockchain. So there is this enterprise standard SAML, right? Oh, I don't know it. Uh, so it's an authentication standard uh, which can be used, uh, authentication and authorization mm -hmm. standard uh, instead of LDAP across organizations. Oh, oh there is. Um, okay. So actually, a lot of enterprises are using it. Oh. Um, okay. For example, if I want to sign uh, into the IEEE library, uh, if KDH has a sample provider uh, and many other enterprises, not just academia. <coughs> IEEE has a consumer um, and I say I'm from KDH, it redirects me to SAML server on the enterprise on-premise. It returns to the service uh, the uh, permissions, like information about me, like that I'm a faculty member or not. Um, so there is an enterprise solution to the problem you described which does not require blockchain, so. Oh, all right, okay. It's just to say that you can apply everything that Axel has said without <laughs> being scared that you need to.
don't plug in for that. Okay, interesting. All right, all right. Thanks. Mike? Yeah, to sort of build on that, Sandal is a really good identity provider. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not such a uh, successful distributed access control mm -hmm. provider. Mm -hmm. And there are some organizations working uh, to try to create better distributed access control. And there's a pattern called Web Token, which is starting to do some of this. So a sample provider can actually issue tokens that uh, actually are the convergence of the service I'm looking for and the identity I'm using. And you can apply that, and that can also be distributed. So one of the things that I think will happen is the way we use DNS servers today to actually find a server. We now, because of SAML and OAuth and other things, we can use SAML and OAuth servers to find an identity. And eventually, we'll be able to use distributed access control servers that will be able to apply for access control. So we have the bits in place, but the hard work of building them and using them and normalizing them needs to be done. And this is another area where standards and standard ways of speaking to each other, of normalizing, would allow people to be just as creative or unique as they want in the features they offer, mm -hmm. but yet still standard in the way they, they speak to each other. So there, there's the beginning of each of these Solid is also working. You, you already have, there's, what is the one that Solid uses for access control? Um, web ACL. It's web ACL, yeah. that's right, there's another one. Oh. So that, and that's even more specific than web tokens. Web tokens is just a okay. avenue, but web ACL okay. specifically is access control. Great, great. Yeah. I, I was certain that I would learn something. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure we understand, I mean, what do you mean by uh, standardized API? as opposed to uh, standardized data models, for instance? Well, the API exposes data so it can conform to the data model. And so th these are two different things. For example, our phone connection, the, comp the way that the, the, the standard that, so that I can call you, let's, I would call, let's think about it as a standard API. The language in which we talk, French, English, you could say that's the, the data model. But this is already standardized, for instance. Uh, I mean, we use like HTTP in, in the case of uh, OSLC, for instance. We use HTTP, we use REST services. So this is already standardized. Yeah, I think OSLC is a great candidate, actually, to have a standard API. But uh, we, it's not yet adopted, I think, and not, not at large scale. And we're also not thinking about um, so much of that, we're not yet, there are other industries like healthcare, financial industry, which could also, you know, be thinking about a standard API and possibly even benefit from OSLC. So uh, I just want to. Yeah. To but just to re caution you against using REST, I mean, people like to say we use HTTP REST, uh, but many people just use HTTP and the degree to which they actually adopt REST is very uncertain. And I think that at REST, Today, the state of practice speaking, that's where the standardization breaks. So, at the point of rest. Yes. But so, I mean, like we, we both come from an uh, engineering background where uh, engineers uh, loved to uh, define those huge mega models, meta models, you know. And uh, we, I mean, especially in Germany. So now you're. <laughs> 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 you know, I mean, look at all those are, you know, all those are, all those are, for instance. And, yeah, yeah. But and then, no, and I, and I completely agree with you. So now you are saying we should not focus on standardizing those no. big meta models because it doesn't work. They're important. We They're important. They're very relevant. All yeah. these data yeah, models are, yeah. are great, but we, but it's not enough. Uh, and, and we should focus our attention just on that. Yeah. Okay, but so, because when I hear you, I have the feelings that uh, we should not standardize any more data models, no, no, but no. more like going a bit uh, at a lower level. But uh, actually, we have to standardize still at, at, at two levels. Because you, you talk about standardization of data models to some extent, or at least yes. life cycle data model, not product data model. When you talk about links between the artifacts, it's, it's still a way to standardize like very basic uh, information models. So we still, we still need this level of standardization as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I have been active at, in the OMG. I've seen how standardization efforts go. And um, I've seen how, you know, getting consensus on some simple things sometimes, it just takes time. Mm -hmm. So these efforts are very important. But, you know, 
not always super efficient. And um, so I wouldn't put all my eggs in that basket. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's an important thing. Right? Yeah, yeah, but it's like kind of two, yeah. two directions. Any other questions before we switch? So thank you again, Excel. And uh, you will be also leading the upcoming uh, panel discussion right now. Yes, on the right now. Yes. Uh, and you will have like uh, chairs. Yes, I think we're going to bring some chairs. Yes, yes. And then uh, Axel, a question for you because uh, on the agenda you want to invite someone. I also noticed when talking to the semantic web community that they had no idea about OSLC. Well, so I suppose it's the same for the hypermedia community. Um, and I think we do have common goals. I think we, we, we do, like, achieving decoupling between applications data is very important for solid. I think for hypermedia, you, you want to standardize, ideally, these, these hypermedia controls. Um, and I think if you achieve this, it, we benefit from it. And I think there's a mutual benefit in in uh, in, um, in in working together. Actually, um, maybe it would be interesting to hear your thoughts uh, after these. You have only been here one day. Uh, so sorry, Ruben, but you've been here one and a half days. One and a half, yes. <laughs> uh, maybe you can start, Mike. <laughs> well, well, I would say um, I agree 100 percent that um, we're working we're working towards similar goals. I forget who I was speaking with over lunch, but I think one of the one of the things I'm often reminded of is if we if we focus on this on the problem space, we find we all have similar problems. If I only focus on my solution, then I think you people are wrong. You know, I think we have to focus on the problem space. What are the business cases? What are the things we're trying to solve? So I think that's very uh, very easy to see as, as we spend time together. That we're focusing on the same challenges. We are trying to get past some of the same situations. So I think that's very, very good. I think another thing that that I've learned over over so many years is that um, it's really important to say, ah, you know, that's a really good way to solve that particular part of the problem. Let me see if I can borrow that. So I think one of the things I'm always interested in is uh, patterns and technologies and efforts that are uh, not just agnostic, but are also very collective. Mm -hmm. Oh, we can use that format, or we can use that model, we can use that language, right? Rather than saying, we all need to be using the tools that we have to kind of do it. So, so that's also very encouraging as I, as I sit here as well. When it comes down to it, what, I'm, what I focus on just because of my, my area or my, you know, my window, my view, my view on the data, I'm just the one app is I'm always interested in how we can improve the way we communicate. That's why the Pepper Media thing is very, very interesting to me, because it's a way that we can think about communicating to each other. And you use your phone example. I, I love the phone example, because there actually are several levers, levels in that phone example, right? There's the electronics, right? And there's the actual uh, uh, applying electronics to phones, and then there's actually the process of being able to find an address and dial an address and call an address, and then there's the actual conversation. We have to agree at least at some level that we're both gonna speak uh, some language. And then there's the information we pass. So every one of those is an excellent opportunity, uh, and every one of those has to have some kind of negotiated element. 
We're going to negotiate the address. We're going to negotiate whether it's going to be a wireless phone or a wired phone or a landline phone or the language we're going to use. So each one of those are opportunities. The comment about uh, should we focus less on models and more on that? No, because we need each one. Mm -hmm. So I'm very encouraged by all of that mm -hmm. and, and just would love to see more discussion at each level, make it easy for vendors to participate, make it easy for researchers to advance the space, and often it's by making those levels clear mm -hmm. and then talking about the relationships between them. That's it. Right. Yeah, lots of um, similar thoughts, um, maybe slightly different or phrased a different way. So <clears throat> starting point is that, uh, to me, these things are about decentralization. About decentralization of blockchain sense in the sense that we don't depend on some central party to do things, right? So we're independent of central parties in a sense. And there was a decentralized web summit in San Francisco beginning of August, and there were lots of startups doing decentralized stuff. And it was very intriguing to me <coughs> because what was so ironic was that the um, decentralized community was working in a very decentralized way. <laughs> we all were indeed looking at the same problems, but with slightly different solutions, so we're not compatible with each other. But hey, we're doing our own thing, right? Um, so that's interesting. Also, from a communication point on a different level, is that it took a lot of effort to communicate among each other to see that how are we actually different? Because if you look at the website, we're doing exactly the same thing. If you talk for 30 minutes, you're doing the exact same <laughs> thing. It's something that are really deep, and you realize, okay, you made a different choice then. And the frustrating thing is that some of these choices, in essence, are arbitrary. Like, okay, you have to make some choice, and we chose this, you chose that, well, too bad, we're compatible. You could have chosen the same thing. And this brings me to what always comes back, is um, the, the paradox of, of freedom. And it says that, um, 